People always assume that as humanity moves forward, it can only get smarter and advance even further the existing technology, but this isn't always the case. Just look at ancient civilizations and all the knowledge that was lost, all the way from the burning of the Library of Alexandria, estimated to push back humanity by a thousand years, to the Voynich Manuscript, supposedly written back in the 15th century and thought to be a medieval medicine book, but that no one can decipher what it really is. If it weren't for the invention of writing and bookkeeping, all the information passed on from generation to generation would eventually get lost. The same with technology. If you don't make stuff, there's no stuff. And if you don't write down how to make it, mankind will forget about it too. And that's exactly what happened in the 15th century when the Byzantine Empire fell, taking away with it their most powerful weapon, a weapon of terror and ruin that could turn whole naval fleets and villages into ashes in a matter of minutes. This reckless weapon was also known as Sea Fire. If you've ever watched Game of Thrones, you might be surprised to find that this was the substance that inspired the wildfire barrels scattered in underground corridors throughout King's Landing, as it too produced green fires and had a high flammability. Legend has it that this substance was so powerful that once ignited no enemy was able to put it out, not even with water. The technological advantage it provided was responsible for many key victories, most notably the salvation of Constantinople from the first and second Arab sieges, where a fleet of 120,000 troops equipped with 1,800 ships attacked the city now known as Istanbul. It is said that the enemy forces were so big that in order to supply the fleet, the supply train alone consisted of 12,000 men, 6,000 camels and the same number of donkeys. This attacking force, compared with the reported 15,000 men defending the city, was expected to win the battle with ease, but no one predicted that Kalinikos would create such a destructive power and so the arrows were massacred for months and reduced to a couple thousand men in the span of a year. The substance, also known as Greek fire, had many versions throughout the centuries, with nations trying to replicate the effects of the infamous weapon used by the Byzantine Empire, but none of them was as effective as the original. Eventually the enemy nations started figuring out ways of putting out the seemingly endless fire, with sand and vinegar being the most common methods. But historians to this day believe that the original recipe was much stronger than the knockoffs who came after it. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the secret recipe died along with the fall of the Byzantine Empire, but it is still claimed to be one of the main reasons that prevented the Muslim expansion into Europe in the medieval times. Speaking of Europe, if you've ever visited or even lived there, you will notice that a lot of Roman structures built centuries ago, such as aqueducts, bridges, walls and temples, are still standing against all odds. Look at the Colosseum for example, it survived three large fires, four earthquakes, numerous storms and it even housed unexpected occupants for a few years, who built stone walls in some areas to divide up the space and looted everything there was to loot. But the fact is, these structures still survive to this day and can be found in much better conditions than more recent buildings across the world. This is due to the famous Roman concrete developed and perfected about 300 years before baby Jesus was born. This new material spurred something of a revolution, most commonly known by historians as the Concrete Revolution, where the Roman Empire started taking on massive projects along their vast territory, creating complex structures such as arches, vaults and domes, which in turn allowed for the development of underwater architecture, blessing the empire with the power of controlling water and shaping all their land into a fortified nation. The secret for this long-lasting material was the use of volcanic ashes, which mixed with sand and limestone from the chemical structure so concise it was able to withstand small earthquakes and the erosion of salt water. As it turns out, not only Roman concrete is more durable than what we can make today, but it actually gets stronger over time. Damascus steel is a legendary type of steel recognizable by its wavy light and dark pattern. It not only is beautiful and stands out from any other metal produced in the 3rd century, but it is also much stronger, especially along the edges, with much more resistance to cracking and is vastly superior to weapons formed from iron. 
Although modern high carbon steels surpass the quality of Damascus steel, the original metal remains an outstanding material, particularly for its day. No one has been able to replicate the original method of making Damascus steel, because it was cast from woods, a type of steel originally made in India over 2000 years ago. India began producing woods well before the birth of Christ, but the weapons and other items made from woods became truly popular in the 3rd and 4th century as its superiority began being recognized in the Middle East and trade started booming in the city of Damascus, modern-day Syria. The techniques for making woods were lost in the 1700s, taking with it the ability of producing this leading-edge war material. Although a great deal of research and reverse engineering has tried to replicate the casting of Damascus steel, no one has been successful so far. But the process itself had some breakthroughs. Cast wood steel was found to be made by melting together iron, steel and charcoal under an environment with little to no oxygen. Under these conditions and with considerable metallurgic skills, the almighty metal would be created and shaped into all kinds of objects with blades being the most popular option for obvious reasons. Nowadays, you can find what it looks like Damascus steel being sold online, but in reality, when you order these products, you are most likely getting a normal steel that has merely been surface treated and mixed with ink to produce a similar watery pattern, which will start to fade away after being used. But pattern welding isn't the secret of Damascus steel. The 6th century Celts used pattern welded blades, so did the 11th century Vikings and the 13th century Samurai. Pattern welding only gives the wavy appearance consistent with Damascus steel. The composition of the steel and the way the layers are forged together matters if you want to get the true properties of Damascus steel that were way ahead of its time. A whole lot of the modern world we enjoy right now exists thanks to the invention of the steam engine, which kicked off the industrial age. It was invented in 1712 and later improved by James Watt, who would get all the credit, right down to everyone using his last name to measure electricity. But when you ask historians, you might be surprised on how far off this invention date really is. Apparently, the steam engine had already been invented 1600 years previous to the start of the Industrial Revolution. Sometime in the first century, an engineer called Aaron of Alexandria set to work on a small, steam-powered turbine that propelled itself by shooting steam out of two openings. It's unclear what the purpose of this small mechanism was, but it is clear that it was too far ahead of its time. Think about it, this early version of a steam engine was around when the New Testament was being written. The only thing was, no one could figure out what to do with it, so it apparently just became a sort of novelty artifact that fortunately was preserved to this day and it's proof that ancient civilizations knew more than what we give them credit for. Another inventor ahead of its time was Claudius Galinus. Claudius was the greatest surgeon in the world back in the 2nd century AD, which is a little like saying he was the smartest guy in a flat earth convention. Other surgeons at the time were convinced that the arteries were filled with air, but Claudius himself was a huge advocate for blood being the main fluid and was the first doctor to prescribe bleeding out as a perfectly reasonable way to cure headaches. But this wasn't his brightest idea. That came later, when he was the first doctor who popularized ligature as a method of stopping uncontrollable bleeding. Ligature, for those who aren't in the medical industry, is tying up a bleeding artery to stop the blood flow and help the body closing down the wound. Before Claudius, there was only one treatment for deadly bleeding, cauterizing, which doesn't sound too bad, unless you know that cauterize is Latin for burn it shut. As a chief surgeon for wounded gladiators in Pergamus, Turkey, Claudius was the first to stop a bleeding by tying up injured vessels closed, and he got so good at zipping folds up that the mortality rates of his charges was next to nothing, which rightfully made him famous. His technique revolutionized medicine, or it would have, if the world hadn't completely forgot about it for the next 1500 years. By the Middle Ages, no one was using the ligature method anymore. Why? Well, lots of brilliant stuff was forgotten during the Dark Ages, like the shape of the earth and how to bathe. In medieval Europe, 
Touching a sick person was a big no-no, seeing that 60% of the population had recently died from a transmissible virus. So instead of tying an injured artery closed, the surgeons just burned it shut with a long metal rod. Meanwhile, the Islamic world actually embraced Claudius thesis and kept his immense legacy alive while the Western world got progressively dumber. It wasn't until 1575 that a French surgeon repopularized Galen's idea about ligature and people started getting their tie on again. They found that ancient Greek uh, computer thing mm -hmm. on what, what is that called? The, the Antikythera anti mechanism. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Again, that testifies to a lost navigational skill that, yes. we, that we have not taken account of before. Incredibly complex, yeah. and it took a long time for them to figure out what that even is. Yeah. What do they think that is now? Um, it, it tracks the movements of the planets. It's a, it's a navigational device. It's, uh, it, it, it's a geared, cogged uh, mm. system that allows you to track the passage of time and figure out where you are. It's, a, it's some kind of navigational device. It's not fully understood. And yet. how old is that? Thinking around about 500 BC very few of these have been found and it may be that ship owners and navigators in Greek times were extremely careful about who they shared this technology oh, with. Of course, it right? may, they, they, they may, it may have been as top secret as you know nuclear power is mm. in, in, in our world today. In a sense, this technology was lost twice. First, when the ship that carried it sank two millennia ago and second, when historians, unmoved by hard to read x-rays of the day, left it to languish for more than a century after it was brought back to the surface in 1901. It was worth the wait though. Once scholars sussed out what this laptop-sized object was, a gear-based mechanism for correctly modeling the movement of the planets, moon and sun, it changed the way we thought of Greek gear technology. One gear's 235 teeth matched the number of months in 19 solar years, which is the shortest time in which solar and lunar cycles line up. The inventor might have in inherited the idea from the ancient Mesopotamians, who used the 235-month cycle and built up great tables that tracked the sky's movement with remarkable accuracy. Other gears and ratios tracked lunar motion, even taking into account hitches caused by the moon's elliptical orbit. Since the decipherment of the so-called Antikythera mechanism, some have wondered over whether a planetarium qualifies as a computer it performs calculations that reveal when eclipses will occur down to the hour, decades in advance. Lunar cycles were vital to the Greeks, who relied on them to cycle farming practices, time religious festivals, schedule payments and plot tactical advantages. Europe would have to wait until 1642 before an effective gear mechanical calculator appeared again. The Pascaline would be invented by French mathematician, inventor and philosopher Blaise Pascal. Cutting devices to, to the Antikythera mechanism may have cropped up here and there in the medieval world, but true astronomical clocks would not reappear in Europe until the 14th century. Please check out this video about the first and only Roman to have ever visited ancient China. Leave a like if you liked this video, subs if you loved it, and thanks for watching it. Obrigado.